So I, I will be um, checking my phone here occasionally, not because I have so many important calls coming, but it'll help me make sure that I use uh, no more than the two hours that Dan has allocated <laughs> for, my, for my talk today. So, <laughs> indeed. The, um, so, if, if you have children, um, then you know what the talk is, okay? And two and a half years ago, my wife and I proudly brought home uh, two 10-year-old boys from Haiti, and, and not, uh, not too many months after we were home, my wife, with a big smile on her face, brought them down into the basement where I was very much enjoying a Washington Nationals baseball game, and uh, told me that it was time for the talk. Uh, some conversation had gone on upstairs, and the, the talk is complicated enough, and then, you know, you also have kids who are just learning English, so that added some extra dimensions to it. And as I started going around to various places talking about p-values uh, to various groups, it occurred to me that, that this is kind of like having the talk. And uh, so when I talk to people about p-values, then they think they know all about it already because they've learned it from others like them, right? <laughs> It, wouldn't be, it wasn't as nearly as interesting a talk as they thought it would be. They stopped listening to me long before I actually stopped talking to them. And I'm pretty sure that by the time I was done, they understood it even less than when I started. What I'd like to do is to illustrate uh, some of the problems that led to our statement on p-values and statistical significance. I'm going to do that through an example, and I quite deliberately chose not to have an agricultural example for two reasons. One is that I didn't want you to be distracted by that. And two, I didn't want you to know how much I don't know about your fields. So we'll go another direction entirely. Science often starts with questions like this one. Um, is there a relationship, uh, uh, an association of some kind between one thing and another? And if there is, what is the cause or what's the mechanism that leads to that relationship? So here's some scientists wanted to know something about whether certain kinds of screen time, as they call it, have an impact on, on how long kids sleep, on sleep duration. Now, if you want to do a study like this, the gold standard is something called a randomized controlled trial. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And in a simple version of that, you would have uh, one group receiving some kind of treatment or intervention or exposure or whatever, and another group doesn't get that or they get, they get a different one. You try to get subjects in the two groups to be as homogeneous as possible, and you randomize, randomly assign people to groups. Now, many kinds of studies, you just can't do that. You, you couldn't do that here. You can't, not only is it not ethical to assign some kids to watch more TV and other kids to watch less, but, well, if you have 12-year-olds, you know you, you can't do that anyway, no matter how much you might want to. So the researchers had hypotheses that they, that they they based on their previous research. They hypothesized that use of any form of electronic media would be negatively associated with sleep duration. They said that furthermore, they expected that the strength of the association would vary based on the level of interactivity of the screen type. So the more active you are in participating in that, they thought it would have a, um, uh, more of an effect, uh, 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 a problem effect on your, um, on your sleep duration. And this is uh, stated very specifically here. We hypothesized that interactive forms of screen time, such as computer use and video gaming, would be associated with shorter bedtime sleep duration compared to passive forms of screen time, such as watching television. And they cared about this because not getting enough sleep affects uh, kids' uh, academic performance and other issues. And they, in fact, they, I'm gonna quote from their abstract Insufficient sleep among school-aged children is a growing concern, as numerous studies have shown that chronic short sleep duration increases the risk of poor academic performance and specific adverse health outcomes. They go on to say, we examined the association between weekday, nighttime sleep duration, and three types of screen exposure, television, chatting, and video gaming. So where did they get subjects for this? Well, they used an existing study, something called the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study, and they used this, um, uh, there's a, a, a cohort that they looked at, 
uh, that was age nine at the time of this, um, of, of this study. And so the bottom line is this is data that had been collected by somebody else already. And, uh, and what is the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study? It's worth knowing to understand this. Uh, it's a longitudinal cohort study, so we're looking at the same group of people over, a, over a, an extended period of time. So they followed approximately 5,000 children born between 98 and 2,000. Data were collected in 20 cities, uh, larger cities. The sample was designed to include a high number of unmarried parents and racial minorities, along with a high proportion of low socioeconomic status. So let me just show you a little bit, uh, just kind of a glimpse of what this, a small bit of this study is like. So here is a, um, here's a template for the interviewer, okay? So here's, here's what somebody's going to use to ask kids these questions that are on the study. And I've highlighted with the green box there the, the three questions that are pertinent to this, okay? Spend time on the computer chatting or instant messaging and so on. And um, if you have, you know, if you have 12 year olds, and you know that these are already sort of outdated questions, but they were the, they were the data that was available at the time that this uh, study was going. Now, that's, that's how much the kids say they spend um, on, um, on screen time. And notice that it's, it's, they don't ask them how many hours, but they have categories for, for, the, for the answers. Now, similarly, they ask the, uh, the caregivers questions about how much sleep the child gets and how much the caregiver says they, they spend um, uh, doing things like watching television or video. So this is just a portion of the survey instrument, and it covers a lot of things, um, parental and sibling relationships, health issues, school issues, and lots, of, lots more. So what did they find? Well, they found that children who watch more than two hours a day of TV had shorter sleep duration compared with those who watch less than two hours a day, p-value of, of less than 0.01, by about 11 minutes. That children who spend more than two hours a day chatting on the computer had shorter sleep duration um, uh, by about 16 minutes with a p-value less than 0.05. And they didn't find a significant association between playing video games or working on the computer more than two hours per day um, and so um, if you weren't like being rushed through this the way I'm rushing you, you would see that actually they got a different result than what they expected, right? They expected that the more interactive something was, the more impact that would have on, on sleep duration and that, that's not quite what they found. Now then they adjusted for other factors like um, uh, sex, race, ethnicity, parental relationship, mother's education, various other things and you see that attenuated the results. So, so now when, when those other uh, factors are, are taken into account, they only found differences uh, for watching TV and those differences dropped from about um, uh, uh, 11 minutes a day to about six minutes a day and they didn't find any other significant associations. Um, for our purposes, we're gonna focus on that top bullet point there, the uh, 11 minutes uh, of TV watching. Okay, let me say that this is a, a fairly typical type of study. Um, going ahead of myself there. Uh, it's typical from a scientific standpoint that they used data that was carefully collected. This was a, a, a highly professionally done study, a data collection to glean some insight. It's typical from a statistical standpoint that they use very standard approaches to to analyzing their data. And I, I say it's actually atypical from a communication standpoint because I think in this study, they, they knocked themselves out to tell, to tell you everything they did, okay? They were, they were extremely transparent in, um, in explaining how they analyzed the data, assumptions they made, and, and they're to be commended uh, for that. Unfortunately, all that stuff is in the paper and it's not in the abstract. And, um, nobody reads beyond the abstract, <laughs> partially because there's only so many hours in a day, but also because it costs a fairly significant amount of money anymore to get to science behind paywalls. And so people read the abstract and the press reads the abstract and, and, uh, and not the paper. So um, let me just say too that um, 
this paper makes very typical mistakes. And, and I want you to know that I did not hunt high and low for this paper. <laughs> I, 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 it took me exactly one shot. Okay? At, at the particular point in time, when I was uh, uh, about a year ago actually, when I was first thinking about how I would present the results of the work that we were doing, I just started thinking about stuff that I cared about. And one of the things I cared about is that my boys really they went to sleep a whole lot easier if they got to watch something on their iPad or whatever to help them fall asleep and wondered whether I was doing them any favors. Um, so I just went out to look at some sleep research and, and uh, Googled something and this was the first paper I found. Okay, so it wasn't hard to hunt for a paper that has these kinds of mistakes in it. So let me uh, say a few words about null hypothesis significance testing so you understand the, the kind of mistakes that I'm, I'm talking about here. The null hypothesis uh, significance testing procedure starts uh, kind of scientifically. You, you have some questions that you want to ask and you collect some data. And remember what we're trying to find out here is the, uh, uh, the relationship between sleep duration and, the, uh, and certain uh, screen watching activities. So you collect some data, in this case you analyze some data that other people collected, but it's, it's the same principle. So what you do then is that you take the evidence from your data and you summarize it in a very specific way. You compute a statistic that measures something about the question of interest that you have, and then you compute a probability about that statistic, and that probability is that that st statistic would be as large, as extreme, as it is, or even larger, under the assumption that there is no effect. That is, assume that there is no effect on sleep duration based on what kind of screen you're watching, and then compute a probability that you would have observed the statistic uh, size that you observed or larger. That assumption of no effect has been traditionally called over the decades the null hypothesis, and that probability that we just talked about how to compute is called a p-value. And if that p-value is small enough, then the researcher concludes that there is a significant effect. Small enough has commonly come to mean less than 0.05. But certain assumptions have to be made when you're uh, computing a p-value, and, and what you could, you could call them is the, um, I call them the underlying statistical model. So you're not just assuming that the null hypothesis is true when you compute the uh, when you compute the p-value, you're assuming sort of everything that went into that computation. And I'll say that again um, later on. But but really, if you start with the the uh, everything that you did that went from went from the raw data to the computation of that p-value has to be known in order to, for that p-value to really be effectively interpreted. So many things related to the model, such as how you deal with missing data, how random uh, or representative your sample is, and so on, all affect what's going on in the p-value, not in its calculation, per se, but in its interpretation, in being able to make an inference about it. So let's go back to this, uh, let's go back to the example. Um, the null hypothesis is that sleep duration is not associated with screen time of various types. So when we calculate the p-value, we assume the answer to our question is no. That is, that there is no association between screen time and sleep duration. And then the p-value is calculated based on the assumption that there is no effect. Now, did I mention that the p-value is calculated based on the assumption that there is no effect? This is not a typo on the screen. It's listed three times because this is a, uh, a logic flaw that gets overlooked. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. But th the bottom line is that you can't use a number to prove something that you assumed in calculating that number. OK? <laughs> can't be done. So what's the logic, uh, again, of, of null hypothesis significance testing? If the p-value is small, that means it's relatively unlikely that we would have seen the data that we saw if all of the assumptions, all of the assumptions were true. So either we had bad luck, which we like to call random error as statisticians, because we, we don't just 
bad luck is, is too non-technical, and uh, that one or more of the assumptions may not be true, or, but, okay, so the issue is here that one of those assumptions, there are a whole bunch of assumptions, one of those assumptions is the only one that people think about at that point. It's sort of like at the, we've done all this work, we've collected all this uh, data, we've made lots of assumptions, we, we made many choices in deciding what we would do with our data, finally we've calculated a p-value, and now if that p-value is small, we focus on one thing and one thing only, and that is the null hypothesis, and not anything about the rest of those assumptions. Now just again, as a quick reminder, so we don't lose track of what we're talking about, uh, we're talking about this result of, uh, uh, if you watched, if a child watched more than two hours a day of TV versus those who watched less, that it was statistically significant that they, and they watched by uh, uh, 11 minutes on average uh, less. Okay. Now, the, uh, um, what we have, what we can understand then about p-values from this, that p less than 0 0.001 is this. If all of the assumptions made by the researchers were correct, including the null hypothesis, then there's less than a one in 1,000 chance that we would have observed a, a test statistic as, as extreme as the one we observed, okay? So that's, that's pretty small, okay? And so, and, and again, uh, just a reminder that we're talking about that 11 minutes here. So we argue this way, a one in 1,000 chance is not very likely, so it's not likely that if all those assumptions are correct, we would have observed this 11 minute difference uh, uh, or one even larger. So therefore, we should evaluate these assumptions, including the null hypothesis. So how should this play out? Well, let me, um, let me just uh, uh, say, let me back up to a minute on this. Um, Think about, I bet you already are, think about just some of the more obvious assumptions that you, you have already thought about without even having seen the paper, right? So you, I know you thought when you, you saw the, the, the population that we were sampling from for the fragile child and uh, well-being study that that's a, a, a population that might not generalize to all populations. There might be issues there of represent, uh, representativeness. I'm sure you also thought about self-reported data, okay? I can assure you that my 12-year-olds have no idea how long they spend uh, doing screen time things, and, and they would be offended by the question, actually. Um, okay, the, um, so R.A. Fisher is a name that's familiar to you if you're in statistics and agriculture, probably the preeminent statistician of the 20th century, and he called results like the one they got, P less than 0 0.001 or whatever, he called those results significant. And by that, he meant that it was worth studying more. It was something that you should look into more. But unfortunately, significant has connotation. It's just loaded with meaning, and so statisticians uh, and, and other scientists have come to draw a distinction between um, what's known as statistical significance, that, that which you can calculate easily, and practical significance. And practical significance is not something that you, that you compute, okay? It's something that's determined by, by the knowledge that's been accumulated in that field up to that point. It's not something that is the result of a, uh, of a computation. But here is what tends to happen. Instead of that, that Fisherian approach where you say, okay, we have something to, that we should delve into more, this is what tends to take place, or what I call, you know, what the blogs will say about this study. Research shows that children who watch TV more during the week, they sleep less than those who don't. You can see that as a headline easily enough, right? And from there, it just doesn't take a very long walk to TV is not good for kids and should be limited, and uh, TV is causing poor performance in schools because it makes kids sleep less, okay? You, I'm sure you can find that, uh, uh, you can imagine those headlines as well. And the authors actually help push in that direction with this conclusion in their abstract. No specific type or use of screen time resulted in significantly shorter sleep duration than another, suggesting that caution should be advised against excessive use of all screens. So if you're having a little trouble with the logic behind that, 
that's because you should be having trouble with the logic behind that. <laughs> the, um, so in other words, though it wasn't even demonstrated in the study, we should worry about all screen usage. Now, let's think about this. These are, these are the kinds of things, this is what this looks like when it gets out in the, in, in the open, okay? When it gets out in the public. And so research shows, okay? When you see the words research shows, you should put up your antennae immediately. The, uh, and you should turn on, maximize your BS detection at that point, okay? Just be ready for that. Um, research shows, one, but how does it show it? Did it show it in one study? Is this, is this study the result of, uh, follows on to many studies that have shown the same thing? Um, then the next words in that, in that headline, children who, okay? All children, nine-year-old children, nine-year-old children from this particular population, nine-year-old children from a population several years ago, which is what's going on here. These, these children were like, you know, in high school by the time this study was published. Sleep less, okay, by how much, that does, that's not what adds up in the headline. And then there's the, uh, the payoff in the abstract, the words excessive use and caution. Okay, those are, you know, those are powerful words. But here's where that, that logic mistake comes in that, that uh, you were kind of groaning about there. They essentially argue that, that they saw, they didn't see significant results, significant differences between TV chatting and video games in the study. But they did notice that TV results in less sleep in the study, so therefore we should watch out for all things, okay? But the problem is that the study does not, and in fact could not possibly prove that first assertion. That assertion would, would, uh, is, not, is not part of the study. So here's a great example I found for what this logic is like, all right, in the bold face here. This is like saying, if you can prove that one suspect was present at a crime scene, but you can't prove that the other was, then you've proved that the two suspects were in dis different places. That's what that logic would be like. Okay, so that it, um, that's a, uh, a shockingly common mistake, but there's other, other more fundamental mistakes in here as well. So let's talk about it from a positive standpoint. What is it that we can scientifically conclude, all right? Well, the safest one is that the children in this study who watched more than two hours of TV slept less by 11 minutes, okay? That's a descriptive statistic. That's, that's just a numerical fact, all right? But nobody's interested in just the children who participate in the study. They want to infer something uh, beyond that. So if all of our assumptions, including assumptions about the representativeness of the sample, are all correct, then this study suggests that nine-year-old children from this population, the population that that fragile uh, child well-being study sampled from, um, then you can make some conclusions about that. And, and if you want to go on and generalize to all children or all nine-year-olds and so on, then, you, then you, you proceed at your own risk and you ought to uh, acknowledge what you're doing when, um, when you make that choice. But here's some other things I'd like to invite you to think about. Um, when you're thinking about uh, sample sizes and p-values and the things that you're worried about that don't have anything to do with sleep, although you may lose sleep over some of them. The, um, did the 11 minutes, does 11 minutes of sleep really matter? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not an expert in that sort of thing. But in your paper, you really ought to explain why. And even better, it would have been much better if the paper talked about, before, the, before analyzing all the results, what does the literature say about how much sleep actually uh, negatively impacts kids. So is 11 minutes a lot? Is it a little? There's, there's, uh, there ought to be information on that. And, and here is the, from the statistician standpoint, here's the most galling thing, okay? It might not bug all of you as much as it bugs me, but when you're trained like I am, this is just a, a thorn in your side, okay? 11 minutes is an estimate, okay? It's, it has variation. It should have a confidence interval associated with it, okay? It's, it's not an exact number, and the p-value tells you absolutely nothing about, uh, about the variation in that 11 minutes. Now let me challenge your thinking in another direction as well. 
What if we got a statistically insignificant result, but it was this one? Suppose that the study showed that, that children who watched two more hours of TV slept an average 90 minutes per night less than those who did not. Okay, now I don't know anything about sleep studies, but I'm, I know how I would get if I was getting 90 minutes less sleep per night than I'm already getting, which isn't enough to begin with. And, but the p-value was not less than 0.05. Would we then say, well, dang, 90 minutes, that seems like something to worry about. But on the other hand, the p-value is only 0.09, so heck with it. Let the little rugrats play with all the video games they want to. You wouldn't do that, okay? You wouldn't do that, and yet results all the time get just sort of tossed out because they don't fall under that, that magic threshold. Yeah. <laughs> um, the real issue is the physical and psychological state of the child, but I didn't hear that mentioned anywhere. That's my question there. Right. So um, the uh, that's not mentioned in the abstract either. But it, they do they do worry about that stuff in the in the paper, but but not nearly enough. I mean, you know, not nearly enough. They're measuring the wrong thing. The, uh, they, they have as measurements, they have as measurements available to them that data they collected, and then whatever else is in the literature that, that talks about um, the impact of sleep on, uh, on children, and all that's important, okay? Uh, all, that's, all that's prior information. And I guess we're gonna talk about Bayesian statistics later on, aren't we? So, okay. So why did we, uh, to, to kind of bring this home here, why did the ASA uh, issue a statement on p-values and statistical significance? Because um, this is not a new problem. The, uh, in fact, so these are words right out of the, uh, the article that we wrote. Let's be clear, nothing in the ASA statement is new. Statisticians and others have been sounding the alarm about these matters for decades to little avail. Here's, here's an example. Um, it has been widely felt, probably for 30 years or more, that significance tests are overemphasized and often misused, and that emphasis should be put on estimation and prediction. Now that was said by the, the winner of the, uh, this is what recently announced, winner of the first international prize in statistics, um, David Cox, and he said that 30 years ago. Okay? So this is, uh, this is not a new situation. And, um, but when we, when, we wrote, when we wrote these words here, um, Nicole and I, they, they were sort of an anthem to the whole reason that we had the p-value discussion. That we've known about the problems forever, but nothing was happening, nothing was changing, and we thought maybe um, a statement by the American Statistical Association might help uh, turn the corner on that. And we got, you know, it, it's kind of outside of our comfort zone, but we got, uh, we got motivated by, by things like this. This is an article in Science News, odds are it's wrong, and then in the, the smaller print there, the subtitle, Science Fails to Face the Shortcomings of Statistics. <laughs> it didn't say science fails to face the shortcomings of uh, lack of understanding of how you do significance tests, <laughs> which would be accurate. So, that's right, it was, it was not interesting to read, but you know, I guess that's the difference between truth and truthiness, right? So, okay. And then a journal, uh, a, um, a, uh, a, you, one of you mentioned sociology earlier, a journal uh, in um, applied psychology uh, and sociology went so far as to ban p-values, so we thought we ought to do something. So let me, let me uh, quickly summarize uh, what we wrote. Um, let me just say, by the way, as I set the context for this, that apparently this resonates. Um, Dan may have exaggerated a bit about trolls and hate mail and so on. He, he may have overstated the case slightly. Um, but uh, but the, the statement has been downloaded uh, um, uh, over 150,000 times, which for a statistics paper is a really, really lot, okay? <laughs> All right, so Taylor Swift, shake it off has been viewed over 1.5 billion times. Um, John Oliver's very nice uh, piece on last week tonight about reproducibility in science was viewed five million times the first week. So compared to those things, not so much, but 150,000 is pretty serious for a, for a statistical paper. And here's what we said uh, in short. 
p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. p-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. Scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a uh, specified threshold. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. A p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. And by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. The biggest takeaway from those six things, I'm thinking that less than 0.05, more than 0.05 is bad for science. And here's what Ken Rothman, one of the people involved in this, uh, in this study, wrote. This is in one of the supplements to the p-value statement. Scientists have embraced and even avidly pursued meaningless differences solely because they are statistically significant and have ignored important effects because they failed to pass the screen of statistical significance. Now here we go. It is a safe bet that people have suffered or died because scientists and editors, regulators, journalists, and others have used significance tests to interpret results and have consequently failed to identify the most beneficial course of action. Those are fighting words. That's pretty serious charges. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe this bright line thinking, I, you know, Ron, and he's all absorbed in this p-value business, and he's just getting a little carried away with all this stuff. But if you don't think bright line thinking is going on, and that isn't clustered around 0.05, what I'm about to show you um, is taken from the literature, okay? So every word that's gonna come up here actually appeared in a scientific article somewhere. And these, in particular, are articles where they achieved a p-value of about 0.06, a little too big, you know, a little too big. Almost significant, okay? <laughs> almost attained significance, almost significant tendency. It's a one number. How does one number have a tendency? Almost became significant, almost but not quite significant, almost statistically significant, almost reached statistical significance, just barely below the level of significance, just beyond significance. And this is a really good one. Surely God loves the 0.06 nearly as much as the 0.05. <laughs> they go on to say in here, and this of course is a, 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 um, a scathing article about, about how um, science is conducted, okay? Um, uh, Rosnell and Rosenthal go on to say at, at the end, uh, following this quote, can there be any doubt that God views the strength of evidence for or against the null hypothesis as a fairly continuous function of the magnitude of P, okay? It's not a break point at 0.05. Okay, so what happens to you if you have a little bit bigger one, 0.08, okay? Well, here's, the, again, this is from the literature, okay? I'm not making this stuff up. A certain trend toward significance, definite trend, a slight tendency toward significance, a strong trend toward significance, trend close to significance, an expected trend, approached our criteria of significance, <coughs> approaching borderline significance, which by the way sounds like a condition, doesn't it, rather than a, <laughs> and approaching, although not reaching, significance. Now you really have a problem, my friends, if your p-value is close to, but not less than 0.05. Now you're in dangerous territory, and here's how people have navigated these waters. Hovered at nearly a significant level. Hovers on the brink of significance, just about significant, just above the margin of significance, just at the conventional level of significance, just barely statistically significant, just borderline significant, just escaped significance, and just failed significance. <laughs> All right, I think I have, um, I've said about enough on this. There's a, a few more things in your slide that you're gonna wanna uh, see that's on your stick, but let me, let me just close with this example because it'll set up things that uh, will be talked about later today. I, and uh, uh, you have in, in the document uh, where you can go for these quotes and, and more. So here's sort of a fundamental problem to close with, all right? We want, we really want the probability that our hypothesis is true, the thing that we're trying to learn. We wanna know the probability that the thing that we're trying to learn is correct given the data that we've collected, but p-values give you the opposite of that. 
They give you the probability of your data assuming something about the hypothesis. And so about 40 years ago, a guy by the name of Ron Carver came up with this crystal clear example for why this is a problem and why mistakes get made. Okay? So he said, what is the probability of obtaining a dead person, D, given that the person was hanged, H, that is in symbol form, just what we were looking at, the probability of D given H, the probability that they're dead given that they were hanged. And he, he says, well, obviously it'll be very high. Okay, a lot of people who are hanged end up dead. So let's, let's just suppose that's 0.97, okay? Now let's reverse the question. What's the probability that a person has been hanged given that the person is dead, okay? So that's probably pretty low, okay? <laughs> Lots of people die without being hung, all right? No one, he says, would be likely to make the mistake of substituting the first estimate, 0.97, for the second one. That is to say that 0.97 is the probability that a person has been hanged given that the person is dead, and yet this is exactly the mistake that's made with the interpretation of statistical significance testing. The, the calculation of probability of D given H is interpreted as the exact other thing, and you see this in scientific literature all the time. Well, don't do that, okay? That's my um, advice for you. So you probably have to ask the question, uh, um, and I, I said this was the last thing, but I, I, I got to say one more thing or Dan will be unhappy with me. The, what, what's, the, what's the answer to this, okay? Why, what do you do if you don't do the things? What do, you, what do you do, okay? Well, first of all, you recognize that inference is hard work. You're scientists, you study things, and you know that the, the answers are not, um, they're not simple and they don't come to you all at once. So what if we just threw out P less than 0.05, that just meant nothing anymore? What would you have to do to get your paper published, your research grant funded, your drug approved, your policy or business recommendation accepted? Well, what, what I argue is that you'd, you'd have to convince people you'd have to make good arguments for your position. And how would you do it? You would argue about the nature and design of your study. You'd talk about what's already known and conjectured and how that fits with what, you, uh, what you've just learned. You'd look at all the statistical results that you have. You wouldn't just function on the p-value. And we really think that researchers really want to do that and know how to do that, but we've developed this culture where the p-value of 0.05 is like this filter, and if you don't achieve that, then you, you sort of can't accomplish what you want, and so then all kinds of monkey business comes along in trying to, uh, to calculate that. And then last thing, really the last thing, is that you'd have to be, also you'd have to be transparent, okay? You'd have to um, tell everyone else everything that was involved in making that decision. How you took that data and turned it into statistical content and then, and then made a conclusion. And you'd have to be really clear about the assumptions made and the actions taken. And so for 50 years or more, 60 years if you go by DR Cox, people have been um, uh, trying to address this problem and we hope that the ASA statement on p-values will encourage people to move in new directions, and, and I hope that this is helpful to you as well, and thank you for your time this morning.